Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to uh, Facebook Live. I'm sorry, welcome to YouTube Live. And welcome and hope everyone's doing well today. It's the 9th of May, 9th of March. Um, it should be out considering now it's March, and we're sw swapping the clocks back this weekend. Um, I forgot that we switched this weekend. I'm trying to arrange my hair here, by the way. Um, you know, uh, and then Stephanie told me that this is actually the last sequence that daylight savings time, you know, f we can remember we turn the clock back, turn the clock forward. I remember spring forward, fall back, right? But the long and the short is that um, we'll change this Saturday night, spring forward. We'll change again in October, and that'll be the last time there was a law passed last year, which gets rid of the swapping, which makes all the sense in the world, right? It was something that made sense when we were farmers, perhaps. For the last 40 years, but they've been debating the pluses and minuses, why it's good, why it's bad. It just makes a lot of confusion. It's very expensive on computers. It puts things up for errors in hospitals, you can imagine. Where did the patient get their meds four hours or five hours or three hours ago? The advantages are far, far outweighed by the disadvantages. Uh, you know, the techs or anyone nurses, you know, you're working seven hours or nine hours. Who's going to cover the extra hour? Who's going to get the less hour? Don't ask, right? There's a million things that go away. Not to mention people climbing on chairs and falling off because they're switching the clocks and moving the handles and moving this or spending a week with the wrong time or oversleeping and undersleeping and um, things like that. Long and short, Congress did something. It's amazing. I never thought they would pass anything, but they passed that law and come next year, we're not going to be having this discussion anymore. Those of you who are senior, of course, will be talking to your children, grandchildren, or whatever else about the days when you walked uphill two miles to school and back home uphill in both directions, as well as changing the clocks back. And that'll be, uh, you'll have the kids or people look at you like, Oh, I remember when we did dial up with AOL, we got those discs in the mail and you would dial and you would hopefully log on and it would take you forever to log on. It would crash and take forever to do anything as opposed to now we're on your phone or anywhere else you're running 5G. Times have changed and fast forward a few years, people think 5G, how barbaric, what were you thinking? Nevertheless, um, today's topic is renal donors. One of the many things that medicine has achieved that was really impressive was the ability to develop techniques laparoscopically for the successful renal donors. It made the surgery less traumatic, increased the number of people willing to be donors. A lot of people die every year who need kidney transplants. Um, the live donor thing is not going to really ever take all the demand, particularly with an aging population. Lots of work going on, many research institutions, artificial kidneys, like artificial pancreas, artificial heart, organ replacements. People have looked at pigs. Uh, people have actually implanted pig kidneys. And there's a lot of work going on, places like NYU, Bob Montgomery, who was at Hopkins many years, great guy, and his team looking at organ transplants. They, Bob was the one who did the multiple patients different families to get the best transplant in the patients. So there's a lot of work being done. And I think, I hope that um, success will happen over the next number of years. In the short term, donors. So we do about three to five donors a week at Hopkins. And then the question is the protocol. It used to be different sites to different protocols, but because people will share organs between different institutions, the group arose together and created protocol. So we won't argue whether you think this protocol is too much or too little. We'll just tell you the protocol. What you're trying to do with the protocol is make certain that you give the right kidney to the patient. And what I mean by that, the right kidney, is you have to be most concerned about the patient donating the kidney. That patient could be in their 20s. Sometimes people are in their 50s, but 20s or 30s, they have 50 plus years to live. We don't want them to have a problem. So you want to make sure you leave them with the best kidneys. So if you have two kidneys, one is a couple of tiny calculi, you'll take the contralateral kidney. Now, ideally, you like to take the left kidney. It's easier to remove than the right. 
has a longer pedicle for the vein, easier to reach the renal artery. You're not near the liver. You're away from the spleen. It's the ideal thing to do. But you can't always do that. So sometimes you need to take the right kidney. Well, what are we looking for? We do non-contrast scans. Is there a stone present? That's it. Main question, main answer. Yes, no. Then you do arterial phase. Yes, you're looking for a mass. Unlikely to find a mass. We've found a few cancers over the years. Sometimes you even find a solitary kidney. You can't be a donor then, or a pan big pancake kidney can't be a donor. But renal arteries, what you see is, is there one? Is there two? Is there prehyla branching? Is there three? Is there four? Where are the renal arteries? If there's too many renal arteries, you might want to take the contralateral kidney because if you sacrifice a renal artery, you can infarct parts of the kidney. You want to look for prehyla branching. Where's the branching happening? Is it early? Is it late? Is it normal? Right? You want to do all of that. You want to also look, make sure you're not missing a small renal cell, rare, but something you could see in arterial phase when they're very vascular, clear cells. But again, arterial is mainly for the arteries. I also get a good look at the veins because we're going in about 35 seconds. We come back in about 70 to 80 seconds to look at the veins, single or multiple renal vein. On the left side, is the vein classically anterior or is it retroaortic or circumaortic? On the right side, is there one, two, or maybe even three occasionally right renal veins? And what's their location? Is there a tumor present, right? Uh, venous phase imaging is very good for looking at that. And finally, delayed phase imaging with excretory phase at about five to six minutes. Yes, you can look for transitional cell, but age of the population, highly unlikely. You'd want to make sure the patient doesn't have something like papillary necrosis. You want to look if the patient has a duplicated collecting system, because then you might decide to um, not take the kidney, or if you take the kidney, where are the ureters? What do you need to do? Sometimes the ureters really do uh, emerge very low at the UV junction, or sometimes they go directly into the bladder. So you would want to know all of those things, and you want to know them up front. You don't want to know them later on. So that becomes indeed very, very, very important to everybody. Not a problem. Now, in terms of other things we do, you need to have the maximum renal length. Sagittal view, I use the excretory phase maximum length. Now, maximum length alone is not good enough. Because you think about it, you can have a long skinny kidney or a short fat kidney. So absolute length is not perfect. What's more important is volumes and we will do volumes. There's many different software packages that can do volume, but we will always do volumes of the kidney and report that. And so if there's a significant difference in volume, that also will impact what kidney they do take. If there's significant issues in terms of length, perhaps, they're going to look a little bit more carefully at excretory type things to make sure the patient really has a normal kidney, that one kidney is not smaller because there's loss of cortex. But again, in volume and reading the studies, we're going to get all that information. So that becomes very, very important. So the 3D mapping we do, we do volume rendering in MIP. Uh, MIP I use a lot for looking at the vessels looking to exclude FMD, the 3D volumes really nicely show me with volumetrics or cinematic, the relationship of the aorta and the renal arteries to each other, whether it's pre branching or two vessels are really arising off the aorta very near to each other. We get all that information. So it's really a comprehensive exam because you're making a decision. There's other reasons why a patient cannot be a donor, but this is the main reason why they can or can't donate a kidney. Which kidney do they donate? Is there any words of caution for the surgeon? All the information you need to do. In this era where donating a kidney may be saving a life, everything we can do on the front end to make sure the outcome is perfect for the donor as well as the recipient is something we owe our patients. And with that, if you go to CTSS, you can see a lot of good examples of variations in anatomy, but um, hopefully many of you are doing these. Many places do renal donors. And sometimes if you're not a center of renal donors, you may still be re doing a renal donor because they want to know if a patient's eligible. So with that, I'll stop there. I'll thank everybody for their time. And I wish everybody has a great day.